Um, yeah, let me give you a copy of a blank one. What I'd like for y'all to do is kind of just go with me, fill it out. I like muscle memory. Um, and at the end, if you are unsure of how you filled it out, I'll give you a copy of the one that I filled out the other day or yesterday. An actual first year? Uh, no, it's not an actual one. I just used, you know, fake names and right. stuff, but I went through it and I highlighted the areas that to me are pay attention to, um, you know, where we're going to have our buyer's initial, where we're going to, you know, before you send that purchase agreement off, what I don't want to happen is send it off and the other agent get it and go, you know, you didn't initial here, you didn't sign here and, you know, reflect that. So like those are important to me. Um, and before we dive in, I have another one coming. I think. Oh, Just in time. Sorry. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Andrew. I'm Suzanne. Suzanne, there you go. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna probably I'm gonna blaze through this today. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time in the trenches. We got three people here. Uh, Suzanne, how long have you been with us? Um, a month, okay. and a half, two. Good deal. Good deal. Well, welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, wrote any offers yet? Um, I have. Yeah. You have? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the favorite? Well, part? Danita helped me. Like, oh, okay. And like, I don't really know. Okay. Good deal. Well, I'm glad you're here. Yes. So, have you wrote anything? Yeah. Not yet. Nothing yet? Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Um, so, I want to get everyone over that hurdle of it's not difficult. You know, I, I'll start off by saying, I started in Louisiana, and uh, these contracts are a lot easier in Louisiana. You kind of have to know your own dates, your own timelines. Like, they don't provide it for you in the contract. I love that Baldwin Realtors and State of Alabama has done this, where, where, where there's a blank with a number filled in. It basically says, if left blank, this is the number provided. Now, before we even get in, I would say I want you to write that number down. Every time you're doing an offer, put that number in, the one that they're – uh, the one that the text like that they give, yeah. unless your deal dictates something different. Uh -huh. I don't like leaving anything blank. I am not Mr. Gray. I don't like yeah. anything being interpreted that could be left to, well, hey, you know, you didn't write anything in there, so I just assumed or whatever. Mm -hmm. Write it, just write it. And I think what it does is it gives you muscle memory, and all of a sudden you start really putting timelines together. You go, oh, an appraisal takes about. 20 days or you know the due diligence and period is, is about 10 days at standard um, I think it just helps your brain kind of recognize those numbers all right so before we before you write a purchase agreement I'm gonna assume that you've been working with buyers uh, or maybe it's your listing and you've gotten uh, you know someone's called you and they're ready to write an offer uh, by this point personally for me before I write one of these things I know my clients pretty well. If I know if they're financing it, I've already, I, I kind of know who their lender is. Have you gotten, you know, I have a pre-approval in my hand. You know, I, last thing we want to do is tow people around town. The first couple offers that you're going to write, they take time. You're going to sit in front of your computer, your computer you're going to go, gosh, man, this is taking so long. Why is it so difficult? Is it going to always be like this? It's not, but I don't want it to be with a bad client. So I want you to go through all this and then you submit it and then you get in the contract and then three days later you have to back out because your buyer was not approved. Um, so those are things I'm always, um, I want you guys to, to have a feeling of before you go into this, like recad your, recad your buyers, um, talk about that. I want you to have them pre-approved uh, or if not, you at least have the conversation and they're working with the lender. Like as you're writing the offer, they're getting it to the, to the lender and you're expecting it back because I send every offer with a pre-approval. I'm not sending an offer that doesn't have a pre-approval. When that listing agent picks it up, I want them to know that my buyer is a sure buyer ready to go. Um, all right, so page one. And Suzanne, I gave y'all blank copies. At the end, I'm gonna give y'all one that I kind of just filled out, just okay. kind of give you as a template. Okay. Um, but I kind of want y'all to, to go in and fill it in as we go. Okay. Cool. All right, so dot, dot loop, DocuSign, what are y'all using? I'm um, dot loop. Dot loop. 
Yeah. Is that where supposed to be using his DocuSign? Uh, as broker Andrew is going to say, DocuSign is the way that we're going to go move forward. Uh, I have been a DotLoop user for over five years now, and I tried to do use DocuSign whenever I came in, and I saw an immediate impact on my how long it was taking me to get offers out, how long it was taking me to get a listing presentation together for my seller, and. and so until I am until command and DocuSign are fully integrated and I can go in and take a class, I know that every document that I need is in command. I'm still using that I'm still paying for it. Um, that's just where I'm comfortable. Whenever I write an offer, um, typically I think I can probably get through an offer in 10 or 15 minutes. And I can do it from my phone if I had to. DocuSign, I wrote an offer uh, about two or three weeks ago, it took me about 45 minutes. So for, for me, I'm like, I'm sweating. You know, my mm -hmm. clients call me like, hey, you said you were going to send it over. I'm like, yeah, I'm just trying to get this figured out. Um, get to you shortly. So, use with what, you know, I, I'm not going to sway one way or another. Whatever you think is um, going to be faster and better for you, use that for now. So, uh, y'all know where to find this. Where do we go? This is Jimmy. I don't know. Is it an intranet? Intranet? Um, I just yes. went through dot loop and just made a new loop and then the documents are like on there and I just added into the loop. Okay. So for the, the doc designers in this uh, yeah. deal, um, easiest way that I do it is I go to, uh, what's it now? Okay, we'll go to, uh, we'll go to the intro. All right. So. Have y'all been playing around on my KW site, the internet? Okay. So when you get into the internet, um, you're going to go to Market Center and Documents. I'd rather teach y'all to go to this anyway because typically any document that you're ever going to need in a transaction is going to be here. There's some wild instances where you're going to call me up and say, or call me and say, mm -hmm. I need to get this, but this document is not on the website. So go to all current forms, and you're going to see a list of everything here. Resident. Well, that's an unapproved lot. Here we go. There we go. All right, <clears throat> so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the site, and when I'm filling it out, I'm going to fill it out. And then for me, even with my dot loop, when I moved here from Louisiana, all my forms are not in my loop right now. So I have to basically fill it out, save that as a PDF, and then I just move it into my, into my loop. DocuSign's a little bit harder to move the documents into the, uh, I don't know what they call it, the, the room and then it goes into the envelope. But for DocuSign? Yeah. So have, you haven't been in DocuSign that much then? Yeah. yeah. All right, so there's a room mm -hmm. that houses all of your documents, and then you put everything in an envelope, and that's what goes out to your client to sign. So I guess uh, the, the thought process is, in you know, if you're, you would really like, round right. up in an envelope, and that's when you're done, I guess. Yeah, everything that's in the envelope you is still the envelope. You sit out. Everything that you sent out for a signature. Uh, the room might be called like 123 Main Street. Your envelope is going to be everything that you sent out to get signed. Um, All right. Question. Yep. Okay, so this is a residential purchase agreement. I've seen just purchase agreement before. Do you like. This should just be it. Uh, unless you went, unless you looked in the B car. There's a B car form. Okay. Uh, Don't use that? Just use this one. Okay. This is 99% of our agents are using this one. Okay. Uh, this one's easy to get to. It's in the. It's in your current forms. Uh, I think I know which one you're talking about. The B car. I looked at it the other day, and there was a few things different about it. And I'm much yeah, rather lay out this have one. the where it, everything like conveys, where you can check off the stuff conveys. It. it doesn't have that. And then one other thing. Uh, I noticed that the on the B car form up here where it says acceptance date and where you initial, that that was on the last page. Okay. That it was not up top. Um, all right, so we got the purchase agreement up, the date of the offer. 
Um, so if y'all want to fill in just today's date. Um, 723. Sorry, yesterday was crazy. All right, and buyer, I just use in my deal, uh, Jim and Jan, though. Uh, that's where you're going to uh, print out whoever you're working with. And the next part, acceptance date, that is to be completed by the final party to sign acceptance of the, of the offer. So if you represent the buyer and you guys write an offer, you present it to the listing agent, and let's just say the listing agent presents it to their seller and they accept it right away, there's no counters, then the listing agent, they're gonna do an acceptance date of 723 right here. So that we know when the offer was written and how long it took to arrive at under contract status. And both parties are gonna initial it right there. So if there's a counter, that's just not filled out at all? Correct. Okay. So if you counter, and or you write the offer, they counter back, and then you don't like it, you counter their counter back. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that goes on for another day or two. Your acceptance date may be 725. It may have taken two days, because you know we typically give a 24 hour window or whatever it is to respond to any of the situation. Uh, but we'd like to know when the offer was initiated, and that's to, you know, if you're writing counters back and forth, and there's another agent that's writing offers, and the seller's bouncing both of them back, if there's ever a squirrely deal, they know that, well, this offer started on this date, and this offer was accepted that day. It just kind of creates a very straight line, timeline. All right, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of read along. If you have questions, let me know. Uh, except in cases of new construction properties, Alabama's a caveat in tour, which I hate saying, buyer beware safe. That's what I would say, buyer beware. If you have any questions, please seek advice of legal counsel. This is a legally binding pre-printed purchase agreement and is subject to negotiation between the parties to the agreement. Prior to its signing by all parties, you may retain legal counsel to review and or prepare this purchase agreement for you. Wherever buyer or seller is mentioned below, if there is more than one buyer or more than one seller party to this agreement, it is understood that the words buyer or seller shall represent all buyers or all sellers. A lot of words to basically say buyer seller represents the clients. A business day is defined as Monday through Friday beginning at 12 a.m. and ending at 11.59 p.m. Uh, that's important for when you start establishing your timelines and your contract dates, uh, so like your inspection period, that's gonna start, if you have 10 business days, that's gonna start the day after acceptance of the contract. So if you accept the offer on 7:23, the due diligence period does not start today. It's gonna start tomorrow. And they just clearly define when that date it is. <clears throat> so what's today, today's third? Thursday? Mm -hmm. So right. Saturday and Sunday wouldn't be considered. Correct. So if you have a uh, five day, uh, not, you're not going to give them five. If they have three days to respond uh, and you write the offer, now that's different, I'm sorry. If you have a due diligence period that's 10 days, 10 business days, and you write the offer on Friday, our due diligence period is going to start on Monday. We're, you can't do anything Saturday and Sunday. You can't call them. The inspectors aren't going to come out. You're not going to be able to do what you need to do. So we're going to start it on the Monday. All right. For the purpose of counting business days, the first day shall mean the day following the acceptance date, notwithstanding the provisions of paragraph 25 herein. Broker, realtor, agent, salesperson shall be hereafter collectively referred to as agent. Blah, blah, blah. All right. So next little area is extremely important. This is basically going to be uh, a regurgitation of our recat form. So if you're representing the buyer, what in what type of agency are you with this buyer? So if you look over at the selling company for, for the purpose of this class, we're writing the offer, so we're representing the buyer. So we're going to go to the selling company, Keller Williams, Alabama Gulf Coast, please write it all out. Write it all out. 
write it all out. Just get in that habit now. Uh, we we shorten it all the time when we're on Facebook or we're talking to people. You know, we write something quick, AGC, but technically our the company, our broker is Keller Williams, Alabama, Gulf Coast. So many agents from other companies, when they write offers to us, they just do AGC and it's frustrating. All right, so for the purpose of this contract, I want to just mark off that we're an agent of the buyer. And by the, when, when I say that, you should have recatted this buyer by now. You should have presented a recat form and explained to them what agency is and how we're going to uh, represent them. We're not going to represent them as a transaction broker. We're going to be their fiduciary uh, responsibility to them. So very important, um, whether you're in DocuSign or DotLoop, we got to make sure we're getting their initials right there whenever you send this offer off. All right, going to number one, property and purchase price. Obviously, uh, tax records in the MLS will give you all, uh, here's what I would like to, like to do too. Off to the side of number one, I kind of marked on here as the template where you find all the information, but I want y'all to kind of get familiar with it. Number one, you're gonna to go to tax records and MLS is where you're gonna find the address, your city, and uh, the MLS may not have the full legal description. I don't rely on other agents on what they're putting into the MLS. Are y'all familiar with going and looking up uh, tax assessor records? Okay. Um, what I will do is I want to get your names after this class, and what I may do is send y'all an email and tell y'all the website to go to. Um, it's Baldwin County Tax Assessor. You follow the links to do a property search, and you put in the address, and it's going to give you a, a ton of information. Um, and you can always use that to your advantage. You should be able to find out what the taxes are, uh, what name it's in. So if uh, if you see any information in the MLS that doesn't jive with the tax records, then it's kind of a red flag. And I would call the listing agent and say like, hey, I'm looking at this and yeah. it looks like it's a different address or it's a different unit number or it's a different whatever. I actually found some, we, we did a FISBO class yesterday and the address, I went, I drove to the neighborhood in Yorkshire and the, I, I took a picture of this, the, you know, the phone number in his yard and I took a picture of the address plate Mm -hmm. on his on his house and it's like 2768 so I looked it up on the tax thing and guess what on the tax thing it says 538 instead of 638 so that was kind of weird so I just ignored it you know as I was thinking How was the, the, the tax record is wrong okay. it's for seven. oh for seven. 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 but hmm. uh but uh so y'all did the call live it was really cool. awesome yeah that's the guy I think that was got laid off or something yeah, it was sad. It like break my heart. Yeah, yeah. So, someone get Did someone get an appointment? It's another yeah. contract. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. Uh, and you'll find that out. I'm, I'm sure that Facebook class went through that. Sometimes you. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah, that's Everyone that's we called. Under contract. I was like, what the heck? Yeah. But I mean, the market right now, yeah, they can do it. Yeah, they can. It, in our, I'm going to get off topic for a minute. You have to find a different way to approach FISBOs right now whenever the market's hot. You can't go in there and throw the MLS app and that you're going to get on MLS and get you whatever. You have to get exposure. We can't do that right now. So many people are looking for homes. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say, are you, you know, are you maximizing what you're getting? Uh, and are you being represented to the, are, are your clients being vetted? The people that are coming through, you vet, yeah. you know, uh, and just, be their friends sometimes. Mm -hmm. I called them the other day. I called the lady, and uh, she actually called me back. And it went under contract again. Uh, I just called her and said, "Listen, you and your husband did a fantastic job on the renovations." I was like, "At this point, I don't know that there's anything that I can offer you. I would love to obviously represent you and try to get you a, a bigger pool of buyers to come in. You've done a great job." She called me back like two days later. We started talking, and then she got it under contract again. So, be their friend. Share the love. All right, so on the tax records, it's gonna give you a legal description. Uh, y'all probably learned this whenever y'all went through uh, your school of the Southeast quarter of the Southeast half, section 10, blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, I love all that stuff because I'm a former oil and gas land man, and that's how I did the majority of my job. Uh, we're not going to go over in detail what all that means because it doesn't happen. So you just make sure you copy and paste from the tax records and put that on your contract. <laughs> All right, so page one, you got to make sure that you get all that filled out. Make sure you have, uh, you can have two initials on this when you send this off for all. Under RECAD and on the bottom of the page. The top part is going to be left blank for now. All right, uh, page two, make sure your property address is at the top of every single page. I see this more often than I should. Um, if one page was ever to get shuffled or lost or misplaced and there's no property address up top then there's nothing like if you just found page two and it got lost somewhere and there was no address up there then what yeah. what's this offer on so make sure that that address is up at the top and i know that there's a way in docusign i know Dotlu. if i i can just plug and play and it populates it into every page i don't know the docusign version yet all right, purchase price, just like you're writing a check. 200000 is what I'm going to use for this offer. And like I said, I am not Mr. Gray, so I do $200,000 and zero, zero over XX. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm... Do you write it out clear and write it out? Yes. We are millennials. We don't write about checks. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, I think I've maybe written out one check. No, I'm kidding me. No, that's serious. I had to call my mom and make sure it was right. I sent her a picture of that. Why didn't like you just get on Google? Yeah. I did, but you know, I get a double I still, check yeah. reference. Like she always sent me a picture of how to write it out. And I just, oh my gosh. That is, I'm not that much of a woman. I don't think. That's funny. Maybe I am. Um, yeah, so yeah, words and the numbers. Yep. Right? And another, there was one form <laughs> at one sad. point that would, when you, and I may be thinking more, I'm still licensed in Louisiana, so when I write a contract in Louisiana, my forms, when I put 200,000 in right here, it populates, it. populates yeah. it right there. I don't think this one does that though. Uh, so I'm not gonna teach that. Um, so under purchase price, this property is being purchased with all improvements, fixtures, appurtenances. Appurtenances are things that run with the land. Um, so easements, a utility easement or anything is gonna run with the, with the property. Uh, subject to any existing building and use restrictions, recorded covenants, deed restrictions, previous mineral exclusions, zoning ordinances, zoning restrictions, zoning designations, the current floodplain, a uh, whole list of things. Uh, again, for the purpose of this class, not really super important yet. We can go into detail later. The terms of this purchase shall be marked below. So. You know your clients by now. You're writing an offer, you have looked at a bunch of houses. You know whether they're cash buyers or um, they're gonna go out and get a loan. So let's do a new mortgage just because cash is really easy. Um, side note, I would put next to cash. Since they're, since they're cash buyers and they're not gonna have a pre-approval, I want proof of funds. So many people will come at you and say, I'm a cash buyer and then you go through the whole process and come to find out they don't have the cash that they need so or they were waiting on a settlement saying that personally too many times really? too many times where i talk to a buyer that says not i'm a cash buyer you know what I mean? well let's just say a buyer comes to me and they're like they're waiting on their attorney to, to pay out a settlement mm -hmm. and they know that in the settlement that they're going to get you know two hundred thousand dollars and the attorney's like you know august 31st that's when you're going to have your so your settlement. And they're so they start looking at houses and they're telling me that they're a cash buyer. I'm like, okay, great, great, great. I've been burning enough times now that I'm gonna say I want proof of funds now. Right. I don't I don't want to know what you're gonna have in cash in a month from now. I want to know what you have in your ledger right now. Right. So I'm asking for proof of funds. And if they start you know squirming, yeah. squirming then it's kind of a red flag. Uh, and that's when I'm definitely getting a buyer agency yeah. agreement signed. Mm -hmm. I don't always get them signed. If I know the people and I trust them and I know that they're going to work with me, uh, I try to as many times as I tell myself. Um, I don't need to. I do do it. Um, so cash, 
try to get a, a, a proof of funds. Well, that just be like a bank statement? Yes. Like so let's just say they are at Regions. They'll get a letterhead or something from Regions that'll say proof of funds. Uh, Jim and Jan Doe have the covered yeah. funds in, reserved in their bank account to make this, to cover the purchase price of this home. I even call those banks sometimes. This is Andrew Lewis. I don't need to know personal information. I want to make sure that you are the one that drafted this proof of funds. Can you verify that you drafted this proof of funds? Yes, that's my client. I wrote that form. I sent it to them. Because they can Just, easily get on yeah. Word, put a region's letterhead on the document, and type something up, and send it to me. So uh, you're going you're gonna to learn those nuances. And uh, that's good. It's uh, CYA, cover your ass. Uh, it, it's cover, and it, you're protecting yourself. You're protecting. The listing agent, you're protecting the seller. You save yourself a lot of headache. You are. You are. And I feel like it's embarrassing if you like offer and then you're like, oh, especially if you know that listing agent. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and you're gonna do deals with them again. Yeah. So like, and they're not know, gonna trust you. You have to. You have to establish that relationship, and you want it to go well the first couple of times because they're gonna bring a buyer to your list, and you want them to go, oh crap. Here we go. Here's Andrew. <laughs> um, now you still may get that as a new agent, but it's all right. All right, so we're going to do a new mortgage on this deal. The full purchase price to be tendered upon execution and delivery of a warranty deed, warranty bill of sale, and lease if the fair home single tax uh, property. Sale is contingent upon buyer's ability to obtain 30 year mortgage. Um, I did conventional for this one. Uh, there is now that conventional 3% deal. Um, so I'm kind of, I think I'm going to base it on the 5% down payment on this is what I've plugged in right here. So conventional mortgage in the approximate amount of 190,000. And y'all know how I arrived at that, right? Right. Okay. I didn't even check my math. I'm, I hope that's right. It's right. Well, I did it with you, I think, in my brain. Okay. I said, when I said it was perfect. Okay, good deal. Uh, uh, the girl at CrossFit this morning beat my ass, so um, I'm still kind of like Jerry right now. Yeah, I think you should do that. Yeah. Which one do you go to? Uh, Jubilee Fitness. Okay, we've been looking at that one. Yeah, my oh, wife I started going there, and then I started going there, and she literally kicked my ass this morning. <laughs> like, we went to um, JH and Mobile, and we were um, okay. trying to figure out which one we go to right here. Uh, so if I'm kind of shaking this wrong. <laughs> uh, all right, so 190000 or in the amount equal to 95% of the purchase price. That's an important box right there because that number needs to match what you just put in the previous box. So if you're doing an FHA and it's three and a half percent down, what's going to be in that box? The percentage box. 96.5, three and a half percent. Can't do math easy. Uh, so at an interest rate not to exceed, less than right now with interest rates as low as they are, I'm putting 4% on my contracts right now. Uh, you know, this time last year, we were putting 5% because there were some 4.375s. I bought a house two years ago and I got 4.375 and that was the best rate that I could get at the time. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. So everything's below four right now. Yeah, um, I mean, unless you just got some dog credit. Uh, but I mean, I would still say you're probably still going to get under 4%. All right, which buyer agrees to apply for immediately, use best efforts to obtain, and accept promptly if tendered? Buyer to provide written loan pre-qualification letter from lender of buyer's ability to obtain financing under the terms of this agreement within five business days. That's pretty standard. I like that date. Um, again, at this point, hopefully they're pre-approved. But once you get this, this contract signed, you now, they need to go to that lender and provide this purchase agreement and say, I know you approved them at 200,000. Here's an offer for 200,000. We need you to get moving on this process and make sure And within five days, we don't always do it, but if within five days, the lender should call you back and say like, they're good. Or if, if you don't hear from them, it's, it's okay. But if you hear from them, uh, they might be like, hey, listen, they just bought a brand new Lexus last week. So their credits uh, you know, just took a 30-point plunge. So uh, 
<laughs> Keep your relationships with the lenders. Talk to them, especially as a new agent. Say, uh, hey, just call to check. There may be nothing that I need to do right now, or if there's nothing that you need from me, I'm just calling you to establish this relationship. I did it. Use it to your advantage. Call. You don't feel bad about it. All right, uh, following acceptance date of this agreement, loan prequal is not a guarantee of final loan approval because it will still have to go through underwriting. Mortgage terms as described in this paragraph shall not be delayed, extended, or otherwise affected by disclosure requirements of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, including the integrated mortgage disclosures required under the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, Regulation X, and the Truth and Lending, Regulation Z. All that stuff to me is still over my head, not a finance guy. I know what it means, but just read it. All right, so we're not gonna do anything with seller financing. Uh, that's a completely different class. Appraisal. This is gonna come from your lender. The lender will order the appraisal. So if the offer is subject to said property appraising for at least the purchase price and the property does not appraise for at least the purchase price, the seller is to be notified in writing, including a copy of the appraisal within 20 business days following acceptance of this agreement. So you go under contract, uh, the appraisal gets ordered, and the appraisal comes back at 191. Um, copy of that appraisal, uh, in writing needs to be written to the listing agent saying here is the appraisal for 123 Main Street. Uh, the property has appraised for 191 and then all of a sudden you get back into negotiations because the seller either has the option to sell it at 191 or the seller is going to say well I'll sell it at 191 but I'm no longer going to give you $8,000 in concessions or whatever the case may be. So all of a sudden you kind of get back into you got to you got to rehash the numbers again. Uh, a lot of times, it's happened to me a couple of times where the appraisal comes back in lower, and if the if we were getting five thousand dollars in closing costs, maybe now the seller's like, "Hey, I can't. I have to walk away from this deal with this amount. I'll sell it. I'll sell the property for one ninety one, but I can't give five thousand. I'll give three thousand. I'll give twenty five hundred. Um, this always protects your buyer. The appraisal is going to always protect your buyer." Um, and it's just one of those deals, but that's very rare. I mean, I feel like realtors do a pretty good job now whenever we market properties. We're marketing them in the right uh, comparables, and there would have to be something, it'd have to be a very difficult property to get uh, incorrect appraisal. I had one uh, two months ago in Mobile, going down toward Dolphin Island. Uh, it was a two bedroom, two bath, uh, home on piers, there were $400,000 homes down the road and there were $60,000 homes down the road because it was kind of in that little kind of fish camps and mm -hmm. some, some residential, some on the water. And so there was just a lot going on and they were listed at 127 or 125 and we were one of four offers and we wrote, it, we wrote our offer at 132. We didn't ask for any closing calls. So we went above asking and we got the deal. Well, when the appraisal came back, it came back at 127, whatever the listing price was. We had to argue it. I had to, we had to call the appraisal and say, how did you come up with those numbers? Because I went to my buyer and said, I feel comfortable that this is going to appraise at 132 because of this home, this home, and this home. So we sent it to the appraisal. The lender had another appraiser go out there and appraise for 132. Oh, wow. So appraiser is... Only as good as the appraiser that's going to what mood he's in that day. Like if he steps in a pile of dog crap in the backyard, he might get pissed off and not give them that bump in price that maybe they should have gotten. Um, but buyer not buy above appraise costs? Yes. So if it does not appraise, your buyer has the ability to back out the contract. But they can still stay in Like it sounded like the way you're making it sound like. So, if, so okay, so we wrote an offer for 200000 mm -hmm. If the appraisal comes back at 191, your buyer, basically the seller has the option to either sell it at 191, or the seller can say, you know what, I can't sell it for 191, and they can back out. Could the seller say, I'm not selling that one at 91 if you still want to buy it at 200,000 euro? You can do that with that. No, not if they're getting financed. 
that's uh, getting okay. financing because the appraisal is going to dictate your financing. So if it was in cash. Yep, if it wasn't contingent upon appraisal. So uh, it's difficult. I mean, most cash offers, I've worked with a lot of cash of buyers, and most of them were investors, and they're not contingent upon appraisal because they're more worried about the cash flow than they are about what the property is worth. Uh, now, your typical retail buyer, if they're getting financing, that appraisal is what's going to ultimately give them the loan. If they're a cash buyer, and they, they can remove, you can draw, draw an addendum that basically says, we hereby remove the appraisal contingency. This loan is, this purchase is no longer contingent upon this property appraising for 200000 The buyer proceeds to move towards it. So the buyer is just saying, I'm going to gamble. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they they really want the house. And that's, exactly. that's you know, what, that's what yeah, yeah. especially like in, it's market by market. Like this market right now, I would, I would argue with every appraisal that we came in underneath there. And I'd be like, listen, there's a shortage of homes. Ultimately, this home is worth what someone's willing to pay for it. We're not off that far. How are you going to, you know, not give me the 5,000, you know, bump on this? Like, just make it work. Mm -hmm. I mean, the buyer's willing to pay that. It's not some crazy number. It's not like everything in the neighborhood is $104 a square foot and we're writing a contract for 120 mm -hmm. I mean, so uh, the appraisal is definitely, uh, definitely there for your buyer. All right, where did that leave off? Buyers shall have the option to waive this contingency and proceed with the consummation of this agreement without regard to the amount of the appraised valuation. That's basically what we just said. Uh, the seller also has that um, ability to. I mean, if the, if the seller ultimately can't get what they need to get for it, then they, you know, they can kind of rely on that appraiser, appraisal and say, well, I thought this home was worth a whole lot more. That's the only reason why I was selling, because I need this amount. And you gotta start renegotiating at that point. Hopefully you don't run into that. You will. That's important. All right, number four, buyer seller cost. Buyer cost. Buyer to pay for closing agent settlement fee, recording fees, and mortgage title insurance premiums required by lender. Any lender required for related fees and credit report fees, any loan and closing costs, any prepaid items, any fees required for the transfer of property pursuant to the Fair hope single tax for first performance unless otherwise agreed upon right. That just means your buyer's got a lot of money to pay to get a loan. Um, so with every loan is just gonna there's gonna be a lot of lender fees, a lot of uh, I don't know if we should talk about that in here, but uh, I would say buyer closing calls. Have y'all done a net sheet class or anything yet? No, I need one so bad. Yeah, so I'm still not even super proficient in that. I didn't have that in Louisiana. Um, but when I'm working with a buyer and they're like, all right, uh, how much are my closing costs going to be? I give a range. I don't say, you know, 2% of the loan value or 2%, 2.5%. I say something like, you know, it could be anywhere from 2 to 2.5% two of the purchase price is what you're going to look at paying in closing costs, which is a pretty substantial number. Mm -hmm. um, so if they're doing a, 5% in this case with closing cost of 2.5%, they need to have about 7.5% with cash on hand to close this deal unless they're getting some back from the seller. Uh, which is crazy. There's so many fees for, the, for buyers. Um, all right, seller costs. Seller to pay for preparation of warranty deed or warranty bill of sale and owner's title insurance policy in the amount of the purchase price. All other costs shall be borne as indicated here in not as many closing costs on the seller side. Commission, uh, recording fees, prep fees, closing agent fees, typically not, uh, other than the commission, there's not a whole lot uh, for the seller. All right, number five, uh, I would refer to the MLS and or as the buyer in this situation. So as you're going through this contract with them, this is included with the property. So all improvements and appurtenances are included in the purchase price, including but not limited to lighting fixture, shade, ceiling fan, drapery, curtain, hardware, window shade, blind, blah, 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 blah. You get the deal. Uh, if there is something being reserved from the sale, the agent should have it in the agent remarks of the office firm. It should be somewhere in the MLS that this light fixture in the kitchen does not convey to the property. 
It's a two thousand dollars chandelier. The seller doesn't want to keep it. It does not come with the property. Um, but your buyer can go in there and say, "Well, it's the only reason why I want this house is because of that chandelier." So we're going to go ahead and write in this contract. We're going to cover our cover our butts, and we want to go ahead and state it in writing. We want the chandelier in the foyer, and we want the wine cooler in the kitchen. I didn't realize how much people fight over that stuff. It's crazy. Like the smallest things. It's crazy. And my wife, we've sold three homes now. And every time we buy a home, the first thing she does is she goes through the entire house, takes out all the fixtures and hardware, and puts our stuff in there. And my wife's got really expensive taste, and they're really expensive chandeliers. <laughs> and every time we go to sell a house, I'm like, all right, so cool. I'm thinking we're going to sell this house for like $293. We're gonna keep that. We'll just take that for our next house. She's like, you know, that's that's gonna sell the house. And like, I'm the realtor, and I'm like, yeah, but it costs like fifteen hundred bucks. And <laughs> like, we're like, taking that. So and, and you cool. know, you know who wins. <laughs> yes. So I never have a chandelier whenever I buy a new home. That's fine. Uh, but it does, you know. That's that's something that people walk in on every home that we've ever had. And it's like, wow, it doesn't look like something chompy out of Lowe's. Mm -hmm. uh, Chompy, that might be a Louisiana turn. Yeah, I have that for that, but I get what you mean. <laughs> Alright, so uh, bathroom vanity mirrors will convey. Make sure that, you know, I, I always check that. Wall mounted televisions, does your buyer need the TVs? They can ask for it. Everything's negotiable. Um, for the purpose of this, and I just put will not convey. The TV wall mounting part where I put will convey. So now, maybe I just want to go and slide my TV up there because I don't want them to pull their mounting hardware down and then me try to put mine up and they've got holes everywhere and maybe the holes don't align so I just like if they're gonna take their TV fine but they need the hardware all right kitchen refrigerator I always ask for it unless you've got some crazy refrigerator that you love toting around from house to house uh, so it will convey washer and dryers you know it's up to your buyers all right so the next deal no items currently in home are to be exchanged or replaced without written agreement by all parties all attachments and fixtures currently installed shall convey to buyer unless specifically itemized below and that would be like if in the mls the seller put chandelier in foyer uh, or chandelier in the kitchen and your buyer's okay with not uh having that chandelier uh, i think i just contradicted myself I was asking for the chandelier, but in this, in my deal that I'm gonna give to y'all after, I put that it was not included in the sale. So would you write? Would you write will not convey? Like the chandelier will not. The floor will not convey. So under this item right here, no items currently in the home installed shall blah blah, blah shall convey to buyer unless specifically itemized below. Uh, chandelier and foyer, wine cooler and kitchen. I so you just, I just made that up. Yeah. So like if they, in the MLS, they put refrigerator does not convey. Like a refrigerator is not an appliance that comes with this house. I'm going to write in there that the buyer wants the refrigerator. This refrigerator will convey? Yes. Okay. So the next one is no item of personal property shall be transferred to buyer except those listed below or in paragraph five above. Uh, personal property listed herein or otherwise attached shall be conveyed at no value for appraisal purposes. Uh, I think I'm talking faster than I'm going through the purchase agreement. So you just put like couch, right? Yeah. So if it's a, uh, you know, if there's a piece of art in there, then you're going to list it, list it there as well. So the, okay, I got it. So the top one, if the seller is reserving something, list it there to reiterate what is in the MLS. So if they're saying. Uh, washer and dryer is not included. Make sure you're putting that in there so that everyone knows that the washer and dryer is not included. If uh, you, on, when you get to the additional provisions on the back of this purchase agreement, we're going to reiterate that we want the washer and dryer. But you can go ahead and put it underneath here. Uh, no item of personal property shall be transferred to buyer except those listed below or in paragraph five above. Buyer to uh, seller to leave washer and dryer. Okay, so you're going to check it, you're going to run it there, and you're going to run it in the back. Yes, because okay. um, we're not this, we're not gray. Right, right, right. Just make sure. Yep. We're kind of gray. It <laughs> can be a little gray. Right. So just, we, just be a, uh, so we decide wanna, what shade of gray you want to be. So like it says, uh, orange, red, five. So we're not this already be considered without if, having to rewrite if, it? If one of those items that we're talking about is listed above. 
Like, what if it is a couch? They don't have a one of for couch up here. Yeah, but I wouldn't have to rewrite that. Or no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, that's good. No, sorry. All right. Um, number six, sale, settlement, or lease of other real estate. Neither this contract or the granting of buyer's loan referred to herein is to be contingent in any manner upon the sale, settlement, or lease of any other real estate unless a contingency for the sale, settlement, or other lease of other real estate is contained herein. So uh, if your buyer, uh, that's what it says. this. If your buyer has another house to sell, if it's contingent upon the sale of their home, you know, we're going to do a separate contingency for that. Um, so when we write the offer and the listing agent's looking at it, it's a contingent offer. Um, Y'all may negotiate, you may go into contract, but it's going to be listed as an like, active contingent or whatever the term is. Um, and they're still going to entertain other offers. So the deal could fall through if you don't sell your house. Yeah. And if another buyer comes through and writes an offer that the seller likes, they'll give you basically a right of first refusal to either match it or to walk away. Uh, and you will get your earnest money back, but um, you know, if someone comes through and they don't have a house to sell, the sellers can entertain those offers and take that offer. But they have to give you proper notice. Um, and if you get to that point, you know, obviously, I like to call it buddy systems, but have another agent that's been doing this for a while, whether it's your mentor or someone on your team or someone that if, it, if you have something that doesn't fall within the purchase agreement, make sure you contact and someone call me, call Danita, say, hey, we're writing this, but we do have a house that needs to be sold. What other form do I need to provide? What do I need to write with this purchase agreement? I could, we could do a class on that, but it would be forever because there's so many other things that we have to do uh, for specific deals. I just want y'all to know the purchase agreement. All right, number seven, very important um, paragraph right here. Inspections and due diligence. Buyer has the obligation to determine all conditions of the property material to buyer's decision to purchase. This offer is contingent on inspections and any other due diligence satisfactory to buyer. If any inspections or any other due diligence are not satisfactory, sellers shall be notified in writing within 10 days, which is fair. Um, <clears throat> following acceptance state of disagreement. Now, I want you all to use the numbers that the contract provides unless your deal dictates something different. If you are in a situation and you know that there's going to be three other offers on a house that you're writing for, and you're just trying to find any way to make your offer look a little bit more attractive than the other person, I would call my buyer and be like, hey, if we get this under contract, are you prepared? We're going to call the inspector tomorrow. We're going to get someone in there ASAP. We're going to get them in there and we're going to make a decision quick and if they say yeah then i might say well we'll do a seven day uh inspection period i know it doesn't sound like much but if every other contract is the same price and everything it's 10 days and all of a sudden they get yours and they're like oh them get it down to seven you just kind of got a leg up on the competition uh it's hard right now because we're so busy inspectors are super busy it's hard to get an inspector to lined up right now uh so that's definitely a a line that you have to walk and be prepared to like as soon as you get this under contract that you don't delay and say, oh, I'm gonna call the inspector tomorrow. Like, get on the phone like that night or send me by an email or whoever your buyer decides they want to use. Like, I need you to get me something scheduled with ASAP. I got a contract that I put a quick timeline on. Is there any way you can get to it first? No, you can't. Okay, buyer, we need to go call some other inspectors. Someone's gonna get to it. Um, so that, that's just one of those things that like you can kind of delay and forget about it and you under contract and you're excited. But you gotta remember that that's if you put a super tight time frame in there to get working on it. Is it rare that it would not be contingent on an inspection? Yeah. Uh, I had so I just sold um, my mom's house and it's like a, it needs to be updated. Like it's just an older home and all that. But um, the there was a guy that came in with an offer cash like i think he was just going to try to rent it out and it was not contingent on the inspection i was just about to say yeah. most cash offers um every investor that i've ever worked with when we write a cash offer it's not um we may put that it's contingent upon inspections but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to go and order the inspections because we still want 10 days to go eh, do we like it do we want it Does, do the numbers work 
Um, but I worked with an investor about two or three months ago. It's her first time buying an investment property. And I just, uh, I kind of messed up. I just uh, assumed that we weren't going to do a formal inspection. She's like, I want to do an inspection. I was like, you do not want to do an inspection on that house. This is a $40,000 house. You are not going to like what that what report that? is going to yeah. say. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be nasty. And you're not going to want it. And we ended up doing it. And for her, it, it was lengthy. It had a lot of stuff wrong. I mean, there was rats everywhere. I mean, there was mildew in some areas. There were things that just in Louisiana. No, this was in Mobile. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> it's, uh, so, but she knew that. And I think for her, it was just like some, a little bit of satisfaction that someone has walked through it and they've listed everything that's wrong with it. She could refer back to that inspection about, yeah, I know it's a, it's a turd, but here's what it is. And I can start working on that as I need to. I can make the changes as I need to. But there's no surprises. But I'll, from, if I'm like, I've bought real properties before and I've been through enough of them where I could kind of walk through it the first time and be like, okay, I know what's going on. Like that's bad wiring. The water heater shot, like the roof looks crappy. That's you know eight thousand that I have to put in it. Like I'm not going to pay four hundred fifty dollars for an inspector to come out there and tell me everything that I kind of just walked through real quick and saw, especially if it's uh, something that's just a real problem. Um, but for your typical retail buyers, this paragraph is super important. Uh, you want them to have the satisfaction that they've had an inspector look at it, and anything that. Uh, you know, would make them unsettled about the property, it's going to come up in the inspector. I mean, I don't know any inspectors that have ever missed something major. Uh, you know, I've had inspectors miss me before, and they close in the deal, and they're like, hey, so-and-so just happened. It didn't show up on the inspection report. It's like, dude, that's, that's home ownership. That's going to, like, these things are going to happen. The inspector maybe didn't see that wood rot right there, but, I mean, he's not... You know, he's not spending two days out there inspecting your house. He's going to spend two hours. Uh, so you're going to have stuff that comes up. But for the most part, inspectors are, uh, they are the um, prime example of CYA. They are going to find everything that they can because they don't ever want to have anyone come back on them and say, you, you missed this. So they're going to put things in there that probably might not even need to be discussed. It all just basically gives your buyer more um, and gives you leverage to negotiate another side here. All right, any inspections and reports if ordered by buyer shall be at buyer's expense. If requested, buyer shall furnish seller at no cost a copy of any reports. Any connection fees required for inspection shall be paid by seller. So if it's a property that the utilities are not set up on and we go under contract, and we're gonna hire an inspector to go in there and look at it, we need the seller to pay to have those utilities connected and put back on so that we can make sure that the electrical works, that the water is running. Um, your buyer should not have to pay for that. Seller is not obligated to pay for improvements or repairs recommended by inspection or due diligence other than those stated in paragraph 11 below. You can flip to 11, uh, which talks about systems and components, fixtures. Uh, basically the main operating systems of the house. We always do seller does, uh, but whenever we get to paragraph 11, I'll go back to this paragraph. All right, seller's property disclosure, if any, is to be provided to buyer within seven business days following acceptance of this agreement. Y'all know where to find seller's property disclosure? Yeah. I'm sure that. Nope. If there is a, um, if there is one. Most real, oh, I was looking for it the other day and I could not find it. Man, log this out and don't ask me what my Paragon login is because it's saved on my computer and out of sight, out of mind. I don't know it. I think I have about 150 different passwords. Um, all right, so when you're in the MLS, there's a little tab that's got the little paper documents. If there's any documents attached to that listing, like so if there's seller disclosures, they're gonna be linked in there. It's one of those little icons? Yes. What's it look like? It's just gonna look like a little, I think it's like a couple papers stacked. If you hover over it, doesn't it, it like? It, if you hover over it, it says it, it'll say documents. 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 And so uh, I've had some realtors that have the disclosures, but they don't put them in MLS. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, um, 
hey, do you have seller disclosures? We're like, yeah, I'll get them. So they'll go to the seller and say, you know, let's do a, a seller disclosure form. Uh, maybe they didn't put it in MLS. Remember, it's a buyer beware safe. Sellers do not have to disclose anything unless it's a health, safety, whatever. Yeah, uh, if it's something that it's harmful, um, you know, whether it's mold or um, well, you definitely want that. Yeah, if there's wooden steps in there that are, you know, beyond. If you that's just that's break. just as a homeowner. You're like, oh yeah, I haven't um, repaired like, that roof. It, it, you know, for like perfect good example is the last home that I sold when we bought it. We ripped some wallpaper down upstairs and we found a dormant spot of mold on there. We had uh, air quality come in there and test it. There was a little bit of high levels in the bathroom because mm -hmm. I pulled the wallpaper down so now it's just kind of in the air. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't harmful. It, the count wasn't so high that it was like harmful to my family or anybody. Mm -hmm. um, we were just doing it to renovate the bathroom because it was severely outdated. Mm -hmm. uh, when I sold the home, I did not disclose that fact. Mm -hmm. It was not a health issue. It wasn't a safety issue. There was nothing going on there that Otherwise, the buyer should be aware of. Right. It had been completely uh, remediated. I used Surf Pro. They came in there with HepaVax just out of mm -hmm. abundance of caution. I did not disclose that because mm -hmm. a buyer might say, well, I don't want the house now. But it wasn't a health and safety, so right. I didn't disclose it. Because you, you remodeled and you live there. Correct. Everybody gets it. Right. Damn. Okay, we got we got to pick it up. Mm -hmm. Holy crap! <laughs> All right, um, I'm a talker, so I gotta get. I'm bad about that. All right, insurance property flood. This offer is subject to buyer's ability to obtain insurance in the amount and for a cost satisfactory to buyer and buyer's lender, if applicable. Um, have a couple inspector uh, insurance people that you have come friends with and immediately talk to your buyers and say, hey, if you don't have an insurance guy that you are comfortable with or that you're familiar with, here's one of my guys. And as soon as you get something under contract, I would send something to, something to that insurance agency, send them the purchase agreement, send them the address, send them something, say, buyers are going under contract, can you run some, uh, can you run some quotes? Uh, the insurance agent may come back and say, this is a floodplain, they're gonna need a Flood elevation certificate or their flood insurance is going to be $2,400 a year. Uh, so have a good insurance agent that you can rely on as soon as uh, you be able to give that recommendation to your buyer. Uh, again, buyer beware state, so they need to make sure that they're also living up to their part of the deal and doing the due diligence themselves. Take that pressure off of you. All right, number nine, this is new to me, <laughs> internet. The offer is subject to buyer's ability to obtain internet service satisfactory buyer. I think there's a couple areas out here, like in Lillian and stuff, that there might be some internet issues. And uh, yes. No yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll satellite internet. Right, right. Because I mean, the last thing you want to do is your buyer is a tech person, but they want to get away from the city, they want to live in the country, but they work from home, they work remote. You get them on a contract, you close in the house, and it's no media calls. It's, no media calls. it's uh, some DSLD. Satellite internet and they call you and they're like, dude, I can't even log on to my server. And I just bought this two hundred thousand dollar house for you. All right, termites and wood destroying insects and fungus. Buyers to is to obtain at buyer's election and expense unless buyers obtain a type of loan which requires this to be a seller's expense. And I think, don't quote me, uh, FHA and some but some loan types, the seller is required to pay for that. Yes, my last one, my mom was It was an FHA? Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, so for this purpose, we, we did a conventional um, loan. So the WIR report is gonna be paid, for, it's gonna be a buyer expense. Uh, make a note right here. On number 10, Aero Exterminating is one of the big companies out here that they offer uh, WIR reports. Um, this is new. I don't think anyone has talked about it yet, but they will not write a WIR on a home that is lifting, like on stilts that is off the ground, like on piers. Yeah. yeah. If they go under there, or they will, but if they can't get to the baseboards, if they can't see the baseboards from the bottom, they will not write. A WIR. So if there is a uh, there's insulation 
or is something under the subfloor. I'm talking about oh, under the subfloor. Okay. So if the house is on stilts and you go up underneath there, if you can't get to the um, the the base floor, yeah. the subfloor, so they're, they're not the only one that, I'm, that I'm aware of. It seems like everybody would probably be jumping on that bandwagon. It, and it may be, but I'm, I'm only running to Arrow right now that's doing that. Uh, they denied the WIR, they wouldn't write it. Uh, we, had, we were already so far in our offer that we ended up just waiving the contingency for this. And my buyer was like, I'm going to get some termite treatment. I'm going to hire a termite company to come in here. But we inspected it, we went over it. Uh, there was no signs of it. So we just kind of rolled the dice yeah. um, and waited. it. You think it being off the ground would lower the Well, and that's not even what they're talking about. Arrow doesn't want the liability that there is termite damage beyond what they can see. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to have their people go out there and pull out all the insulation under the home mm -hmm. to go and inspect the subfloors. I so, heard something about like you know, how you can foam insulate your attics now. Yeah. I don't like that either. No, I mean, I don't quote me on that. I feel like they have like eggs in that one. Yeah, I think it hides a lot of issues. If there's a wood rot or anything. And that's expensive. It is. To do the phone this way. All right. Um, where are they? Oh, my team. Oh, well, right. Yeah, dark. Well, oh, wait, on, 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 on number 10, uh, if any repairs are required from the inspection report, such as cost of such repairs will be paid by seller. Uh, just again, protect your buyer. The party who is responsible for the cost of repairs and or treatment shall have the right to terminate this contract at their sole discretion if the cost of the extent of the repairs and or treatment is not acceptable. If the results of either the WIR or the structural inspection are not acceptable to the buyer, seller, seller shall be notified in writing within 10 business days following acceptance of this contract. I usually just, that same number, 10 business days, I'm replicating that from my due diligence period. So during that time, if it's unacceptable to the buyers, let's let the seller know that we saw some structural, some structural damage and we're not satisfied. It is the sole responsibility of the buyer to obtain a new termite wood infestation contract for the retreatment and or repair of damage caused by wood destroying organisms from a pest control company of buyer's choice with coverages satisfactory to the buyer. This new termite wood infestation contract shall be contained at buyer's expense. Seller shall not transfer an existing termite wood infestation contract to the buyer. It will happen. There are times where it does transfer, it's negotiated, um, but I always recommend my buyer give it on their own. All right, 11, systems and components fixture. Seller does warrant that the heating, cooling, and air conditioning equipment, including window units, plumbing, electrical systems, and all including appliances shall be in proper working order at time of closing. Um, going back to the other paragraph, this is basically just ensuring that whenever you go in there and you do your inspections, that the seller has um, utilities on and that everything is in in working order and whenever you close everything's still in working order as it was when you did the uh, inspection whenever you went on the contract and this is also like the main system they don't mention stuff like drywall mix it, like this is not what this is about so if you went and did the home inspection and the house was perfectly you know, completely redone and then you go to do your final walkthrough and you see a scuff in the wall that's not what this is talking about we're talking about the main components of the house. Home warranty. Uh, I don't know that I've ever written an offer for a buyer that, and we didn't, either the seller didn't pay for the home warranty, the buyer didn't pay for it, or I didn't pay for it. And it just gives them a sense of when I move in day one, if anything major were to go wrong for the first year, I have something that I can rely on that gives me some sense of, uh, you know, some sort of protection. You just give them that as like a closing gift? Yes, I've done that before for a lot of my first time home buyers. That's um, now, if they bought a $90,000 property from me and my commission is $2,000, I'm not going to give them a five dollars home warranty. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give them a gift card that, you know, chilies or whatever. Uh, all right, if property is covered by an existing home warranty, warranty to be transferred to buyer at closing if transferable. 
If property is not currently covered, a home warranty subject to limitations, exclusions, and or deductible shall be furnished at the expense of, and I put on here, on the template buyer, because that's what Stacy used, but I always ask the seller to pay for it. Now, remember, every situation is different. If you're in a situation that has four other offers on the table, why why ask why nitpick the seller for five hundred bucks? Just tell your buyer, hey, listen, how about I split the difference with you? You pay two fifty, you get a year of coverage. I'll pay two fifty, and you'll have a you know you'll get you'll move into the same you have a, a year of peace of mind. Um, to be furnished at the expense of buyer for the purpose of this one. Uh, from and I put Old Republic. That's who I use most of the time. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there. Uh, Get familiar with the home warranty company and make friends with them. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Todd is the guy with Old Republic out here. Get to know him. He'll I'll send you a bunch you. of yeah. He'll send you a bunch of information. He'll help you call him, ask questions. Um, at a cost not to exceed five hundred is typically the number. Uh, Old Republic went up on prices, so you may want to put five twenty five in there. This I think was their base package cost. Shall be ordered by the selling company. So if you're representing the buyer, you're going to order the home warranty for your client. Buyer solely responsible for selection of home warranty company and or review of warranty coverage. Definitely talk to them about the warranty and what they're getting. They may want the platinum package. It's going to cost a little bit more, but they may want that. All right, lead based paint disclosure. It's pretty basic. Uh, if the property was built prior to 1978, you need to have a lead based paint disclosure signed by the seller. And you need to have your buyer sign off on that as well to go into contract. 14, title insurance. The seller shall cause an alter commitment for title insurance in the amount of the purchase price to be provided at closing the seller's expense. Uh, this is a buyer option, but most buyers that are using a loan are gonna be required to have the title insurance. Uh, with their loan. All right, closing shall be at a location of seller's election unless otherwise noted here. So this is another find someone, get comfortable with them, anchor title, uh, you know, there's a bunch of rely title. Find someone that you're comfortable with and use them, use them as a resource to ask them questions. Uh, but it's it's negotiable. I've had sellers that are like, I have to close here because that's where I've closed all my properties. And then I have some buyers that are like, I don't feel comfortable buying a home unless I close it with my aunt at Anchor Title. And we have to go Anchor Title. Uh, title to be taken in the name of, this is important. Um, it needs to be Jim and Jan Doe. If that's who's signing off on it, if they're buying it for their daughter, then that's a whole different situation. With right of survivorship. Subject to the provisions here in the seller owned mineral rights and any you can pay. All right, um, number 15, property taxes, public improvements, property taxes, or fair with single tax corporation rents shall be prorated through the date of closing. Liens for public improvements shall be paid by seller without proration. Assessments for public improvement that are not yet lien but become due after closing shall be assumed by buyer. Um, this is a whole lot of um, jargon that, the, you know, at the end of this paragraph, uh, an additional assessment levied against the property as a result of this sale shall be paid by the buyer. You can go to the Baldwin zoning if you want to make a note and call up the planning and zoning and act dumb, call them and say, just got a property in the contract. This is the address. Is there anything that I should be aware of? And I would have my buyers do that. That's not something that I do for my buyers. All right. Um, 16 lease agreements, rental management agreements, license agreements. If this property is subject to any lease management agreements or license agreements, this offer will be contingent on buyer's acceptance thereof. The seller has five business days following the acceptance date to provide all copies. So if you buy an investment property and there's a tenant in the building, 
like, I want five days for them to give me the copies of the lease agreements and earnest money or not earnest money, deposits that the renter has put in on the property. And uh, side note again, um, under here it says all security deposits, lease agreements, rental management agreements, or license agreements to be transferred to buyer at closing. Lease or rental payments, if any, are to be prorated through the date of closing. Recently got into a situation on a commercial multifamily deal where the buyer had written an offer before me and Marco took over the listing. Marco, Marco Toledo is an agent in Orange Beach. He had the listing. The listing expired. The day the listing expired, a buyer that knew that the listing was about to expire came in, wrote an offer, not with Marco, unrepresented on his own contract. Um, the deal fell through. He did not close on it. It was supposed to close May 29th. The deal did not close. Marco called me up and said, I would like your help in getting this back on the market listed and let's see if we can get it sold. So like literally June 1st or whatever, we went out there listed, it, got it back on the market, marketed for probably 20 or 30 days, received a couple offers, rejected them all. They were low ball offers. This guy comes back to the table. It says my financing fell through last time because of COVID, everything kind of got shuffled. Uh, I'm now a cash buyer and I want to, to resume. Uh, after several days of negotiating, we agreed to cancel his old offer, the dates and everything. It was null and that contract was null and void but I rewrote an offer as a transaction broker for him based on the same information that was in that agreement. In that agreement mentioned nothing about security deposits or anything being transferred. We talked to the sellers about it and we agreed to uh, security deposits that they had received years ago from these tenants were not gonna be transferred. But we didn't mention the prorating of the rent and the deal closed on the 10th. So the buyer was like, all right, so do I get my 20 days work? And we're, I mean, I'm like, yeah, of course, because I know that that language is in my purchase agreement, not remembering that it was his purchase agreement that we basically duplicated and there was no mention of it. Um, so we basically had to go to the sellers and be like, listen, I know that it was not physically in this deal, but this deal does not close tomorrow if we don't agree to prorate the rents. So they ended up having to write a check for, you know, $4,000 or whatever the, their 10 days, they got their 10 days worth of rent, but the other 20 days they had to write a check for the difference. Mm -hmm. So if you get an offer on a listing that's not on this form, just review it in its entirety. Read through it, um, especially if it's something like this. You want to make sure that uh, those things are being transferred. All right. Uh, Owners Association Assessments, number 17. Um, get these docs from the listing agent. Uh, this property is not subject to any property owners association. If this property is subject to a property owners association, then you've got A through G right here. Um, I think what you have to fill out here is uh, I usually check that off. It's not subject to any property. Uh, you know what? I don't check that out. I'm sorry. Most places have an owners association. They do. Um, so I usually leave that one blank in case there's something crazy in there when I get the owner's assessment or association documents back and it says, like, you can't park a boat in the side yard. My clients have a big boat. Um, <clears throat> number C, letter C owner's association assessments that become due prior to closing but after acceptance date of this agreement shall be paid by the seller. So if you go into contract in March, but dues are due in April, but you don't close until June, the seller needs to pay for those dues and uh, they can be prorated at closing. That's not, that's not a free gimme for the seller to say, I'm not paying for the dues. Uh, letter D, owners association assessments that are approved by the association prior to closing but do not become due and payable until after the closing shall be paid by uh, station mark seller when she was teaching this class. Um, I think I disagree with that. And I, on the form that I'm going to get, you're going to see where I scribbled it out. I, I did put seller there, 
because uh, I'm just kind of kind of copying from what Stacy taught in her class. Uh, I like Bayer. Uh, it says Bayer in the blank. Yeah. I think you're just going to have a lot less issues if it's a buyer expense because they're the one benefiting. Yeah. And it's, if it's approved by the association prior to closing, um, but does not become due and payable until after the closing, to me, the seller shouldn't have to pay for something that they're selling. They, they, they can't determine when the association is going to do something. Right. Uh, but it's talk to your buyer. And then protecting the buyer. Talk to your buyer, get the association docs from the listing agent, go through it together. If there's an issue and you call the association, like if you sell a house in Lake Forest, call the association. Hey, is, is there anything going on that my buyer should be aware of? Yeah, we're actually doing a special sidewalks in here. Yeah, we're doing new sidewalks. Um, and dues are going to go from $70 a month to you know, $100. Well, thank you. Thank you didn't know about that. Um, again, number 17, get the docs from the listing agent and have your buyers call the association so they can get familiar with what they can and can't do. That's a big one around here because almost like Suzanne said, it, every neighborhood around here basically has them. All right, we're going to place the rest of this. Uh, 18, survey elevation certificate. Uh, this offer is contingent on survey elevation certificate. Uh, use, the, use the numbers that they provide here, the 15 days and three business days. Um, I always mark off, seller will provide an existing survey, seller will provide an existing elevation certificate. If the seller does not have an elevation certificate and the insurance agent calls you up and says this property is in a flood zone and there's not an elevation certificate on file and your buyer needs one, uh, that's something that you're gonna have to negotiate, figure out who's gonna pay for it. Um, but I usually just have the seller provide, and the listing agent should, as they're reviewing this emergency agreement, go, oh, okay, well, we have an existing survey, we'll give that to you. We have an existing elevation certificate, we'll give that to you. If they don't, they should counter this purchase agreement back. Even if they agree to every other thing in this purchase agreement, if I'm the listing agent, I would say, everything else in this contract is fine, but however, number 18, uh, Seller does not have an, uh, an existing elevation certificate and will not provide one. So buyer will need to uh, come up with the funds in their own. Out here, I think they're probably in the four to five dollar range. I don't know. I haven't had to do one yet. Number 19, final walkthrough and verification of condition. Buyer shall have the right to make a final verification walkthrough of the property prior to closing, not as a contingency of sale, but solely to confirm property is maintained in the same condition as it was on the acceptance date. Repairs have been completed that were agreed to um, by buyer and seller. The following utilities are to be provided by seller through the date of closing, electric, water, sewer, and gas if applicable. If you are closing at the end of the week on like a Friday or something, uh, I would negotiate with the listing agent to make sure that the seller does not turn off the utilities until like Monday. Last thing you wanna do is the seller to uh, turn them off on the Friday, the day of closing, you buyer get in there and not be able to get through. Maybe they can't come out there connected and all of a sudden now you've got really pissed off buyers because they just bought a 200,000 dollar house and they can't get utilities set up for the weekend. Uh, so if you're, if, you, if you're on a Friday, just try to push it to the Monday. Three days is not going to do anything. Um, and you can get some of that stuff set up in advance. <clears throat> All right, number 20, closing and possession dates. The sale shall be closed in the warranty deed, warranty bill of sale, shall be delivered on, and just write, I put on the date of this one, 831, 2020, or sooner if mutually agreed upon in writing by buyer and seller. Time is of the essence with respect to all terms, conditions, obligations, and particulars of this agreement. Buyer acknowledges and agrees that any terms and conditions imposed by buyer's lender or by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau requirements shall not relieve buyer of the obligation to close. All parties agree and understand that disbursement shall be made at closing or no later than two business days after closing if loan documents are delayed. Possession is to be given to buyer at closing. Um, there will be situations where maybe the seller needs three extra days to get everything out. Then you've got to make sure that you've dropped in some type of addendum. I would have the seller pay you rent 
if they're going to be there for three days. I don't like this because Murphy's Law is real and Murphy's Law shit does happen. Probably should be cursed. Um, I would be really upset if my buyer bought a house. The seller needed three more days to get something done. And in those three days, the water heater or something went out. The seller was like, mm, I don't know what happened. And now all of a sudden, you're trying to figure out, well, I'm paying for that. You paying for that. You paying for that. <laughs> Again, I'm not great. I'm black and white. Yeah. I'm going to do it at closing. And if there is a three day deal, I'm going to specify something in the denim that, you know, seller shall pay. And I'm going to, if you break out, like say the market rent is $1,500 and you break that out over 30 days and you figure out what the per diem is, mm -hmm. I'm going a lot higher yeah. because now there's, uh, there's too much going on. Yeah. The sellers are going to be there for three days while my buyers sit back. So I'm going to charge a premium for that seller to stay there three days. They don't get to walk away with, you know, Spending say fifty dollars a day or whatever yeah. the price is, like I'm gonna charge you a lot. Or they might even have to like stay in a hotel until you know the main like there's plenty of experience. Yeah. Yeah. So, so at, courage, all right. at closing, um, you're gonna have situations where you have to negotiate that, but if you do, just make sure you have something in writing. You don't just say, Oh yeah, you're good, your seller can stay there for three days, my buyers are fine with that. Your buyers are not fine with that. Because when they go to closing and they don't get the keys. And you know, day three comes along, and the sellers are not completely out, and they're like trying to move their stuff in. You're going to get into a situation where you wish you hadn't, you wish you had just had to sell everything out in the first place. Yeah. Uh, so just make a note there that if you don't do that closing, document, 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 cover your ass. All right, number 21, fairly simple, we're not going to go over in detail. Uh, Basically, five business days from the closing death from the closing date shall be allowed if such time is needed to comply with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, if the lender calls and for whatever reason they need an extension of closing date, you don't have to do it. And, and another addendum: this purchase agreement will cover it for five days. If it goes longer than five days, you will need to do an addendum and do an extension of contract. Twenty-two risk of loss if the property is destroyed or materially damaged by a reason of fire, flood, hurricane, name, tropical storm, tornado, other acts of God between acceptance date of this agreement and the closing date. The seller is and the seller is unable to restore it to its previous condition. The buyer shall have the option of canceling the agreement. So if they write the offer, hurricane comes through, destroys it. Uh, you have the ability to to walk away. You're not obligated to it, which is pretty important value. All right, number 23, time to respond. Bar gives the listing agent above name until, and for the purpose of this agreement, I put 725. That's two days for them to review this contract. That's probably a little longer than I typically do. I typically go 24 hours. Again, this is going to be based on the property. If you got four other offers, I'm not giving them 24 hours to decide. If I'm right, be reasonable though. If you write the offer at 8 a.m. in the morning, I'm going to do 5 p.m. The same day. Right. Yeah. Don't send the offer at 10 p.m. at night and say you need to respond by 9 a.m. the next morning. They're asleep. The listing agent hasn't presented it, and the listing agent is going to start at 10 tomorrow. Yeah. Be reasonable and understand. This is something that I wasn't taught, and I wish I would have realized. When you're drafting this purchase agreement, talk to your buyer and say, "Are you ready to sign?" If they say yes, say, "Okay, good." And all these timelines that we're talking about are great. If I put in there that they have until 5 p.m. tonight to respond and I'm writing this offer at 9 a.m. in the morning and you don't get off of work until 5 and you can't sign it and you get off of work at yeah. 5 and you sign it and this, now they, they have no time to respond and you look it just looks bad from the listing agent. Mm -hmm. So say, hey, if we agree to this, then I need you to sign this document ASAP. I'm going to come drive there and you're going to sign it in person. You're going to figure it out. Um, yeah, these two are definitely based on local activity. So this is, uh, you know, 24 hours is pretty standard. So if you write your first deal, 24 hours is standard. Uh, you don't have to go that far. Uh, base it on what's going on with the property. If the property's been on the market for 372 days. You're saying if you got in that offer this morning at 8.30, 9 o'clock, you can... If I'm you, writing the offer you, at you 9... say, I need to know at 9. Today. Absolutely. Yeah. End of the day. Absolutely. Before end of the day, I need to know. All right, number 24, all offers and any counter offers may be withdrawn at any time by buyer or seller prior to delivery of acceptance and written notification thereof. Buyer understands that offers 
other than buyer's offers may have been made or may be made to seller before seller acts on or while seller is considering buyer's offer or counter offers. You're not the only buyer out there. Your buyer's not the only people. You're not the only agent out there. Everyone's running offers. The seller's trying to get the best bang for their buck. That's why it's so important to make sure that we have a consistent timeline when we wrote the offer and our dates match up. Because if there's ever a situation where um, I wish the needle would pop back in, she had one recently where um, basically the seller kind of uh, accepted two offers. It was a very shady situation. How do you do that? Uh, and it was all by like two minutes. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how it happens, but it did. It can happen. I mean, can it? I mean, it's like if you're, if you're, so it was a, uh, it was basically a, one was a cash offer, one was a finance offer. They, the agent got the finance offer in and then went back to that cash buyer and said, we have an offer on the table. And I don't know what the agency was, if it was a dual agent or what. Uh, hey, Mr. Cash Buyer, do you want to write an offer? Yes, let's put it in and put it in. And I guess when the seller signed the documents or which one they went over, I don't know how it happened, but the seller had two accepted offers. Bad, bad. I'm going to. If I can grab the needle for a second, I'll, I'll tell you share that. That's not, not fun. Earnest money deposit. Uh, this is uh, this is an important one. Uh, it doesn't take much to go over. Uh, negotiable on the amount, typically 1% of the sales price. So for this one, I put $2,000 as the earnest money. That's not a hard deal. I mean, 1000 And that shows years. you're serious. Yeah. Guess. If it's been on the market for 300 days, I may do 500 bucks. Um, if it's been on the market for three days and there's a lot of activity, then I'm going to put a thousand, two thousand dollars earnings money deposit down. Um, within three business days uh, is when they need to have the earnest money to us uh, as the agent. Earnest money is to be deposited in escrow by me, Benita, by the selling broker. Uh, within five business days following the acceptance date. Um, if there's a situation that doesn't allow for these timelines, I would specify in the additional provisions at the end of this purchase agreement, such as seller or buyer lives out of state and will be mailing a check. I may just ask for a little bit more time to get the earnest money in to make sure that we get it in the time frame allowed. Uh, if you're representing the buyer, we like to hold the earnest money with our broker and with us. When the title company is going to get this purchase agreement and they go through it and they're reviewing it, they're going to see $2,000 as earnest money. They know that they're not holding the funds, that it's with the broker. So when they do the final HUD before closing or the closing disclosure, they're going to take that $2,000 out of the purchase price for your buyer. Okay. Uh, Alabama is a, on the next page, if a dispute arises between buyer and seller as to the final disposition of the earnest money, holder shall be authorized to interplead the earnest money into the court. So if you have a buyer and you wrote a $2,000 earnest money, and this, this, is, this is actually pretty serious, um, especially if you're working with a first time home buyer that doesn't have a whole lot of money floating around. If you go under contract on a property and they just like, you know what, I don't want it and in order to get that money back into your buyer's hands, both parties have to sign yeah. the release. And if your seller goes, well, you know what? You dragged me through the mud for one and a half months and you weren't able to get this thing closed, I'm not signing. It'll sit in our broker account and forever. <laughs> we're not gonna hold it forever. At some point, we're gonna interplead it to the court and say like, hey courts, y'all figured this out. This is not our deal anymore. Typically what happens is that split right down the middle. Um, and you, you just have to know it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I had one last week that I had to do that on. Uh, both parties just had to agree that they were, it was over a thousand dollars. So each party got five hundred bucks. Each party felt that they had been wrong and the best way to do it instead of, you know, it being a prideful match and trying to go who gets what, it was like a, hey, let's just split this down the middle. Otherwise it may be six months to a year before mm -hmm. the other party says, you know what, whatever. And things could have happened by that. house could have already sold to somebody else. Oh yeah, yeah listen, it, no stake it, anything when you start putting, bucks. yeah, when you start putting uh, time stuff on this, it just gets, uh, I know I got one that I got a call on today that I think it's been, in, it's been in our account for six months and the buyer has kind of come back in and said, like, all right, let's figure something out. Um, 
I either want all my money or a portion of it. So now I'm going to have to call. It's made, the house isn't even on the market anymore. We're going to have to call the seller and be like, hey, uh, you know, buyer came back and he's willing to just take half. We you have. Okay, yes, cool. Get both of them signed and then release it. All right, 26, default legal remedies, default by buyer. In the event buyer fails to consummate this executed accepted agreement, seller shall have the right to elect one of the following remedies to obtain the earnest money as liquidated damages, but you have to get approval from both sides. Um, to seek to enforce specific performance of this agreement, to terminate this agreement, and thereafter seek to recover damages against buyer for breach of contract. Uh, we can talk about all these legal remedies until you start getting into some high dollar properties and some serious stuff. It's not going to cost the cost to hire legal counsel to negotiate this is going to far outweigh what the yeah. money that we're talking about. Um, if you ever get into any legal situation, call your broker and we'll get with Don. Don's kind of like our in-house. He's not legal. He's not an attorney, but he's been on it on the legal side enough. He's kind of like our, uh, Mediator, so to speak. Uh, so, your buyer client or your the other agent ever talks, even says the word attorney or lawyer, immediately call me, call Danita, call Don. Immediately, if you hear those words, even if they're just doing it as a scare, scare tactic, like, "Well, I'll call my attorney." Call me, call Danita, call Don. Uh, that's one thing we just want to do. We want to keep your clients and us out of. Legal. Does earnest is earnest money a necessity from a buyer, or is it just it's, you want to you want to show your will. seriousness? It's a good will. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna always see it. Do you see? Go. I, I make an offer, but I'm not gonna give any earnest money because I can walk. I guess they're actually ninety five percent of the time. Uh, ninety five like ninety five percent of the time I see it. I mean, like if I'm writing a cash offer for an investor and it's a forty thousand dollar house in Mobile. He may not put earnest money down. might because we might close it in seven days. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna, you know. Sure. We're not doing inspection. We're not doing a loan. The point. We're not doing anything. Yeah. We just want to make sure that I've yeah. got the funds in. Yeah. I'm not gonna go and put, you know, five hundred dollar earnest money. Yeah. We made. So. Um. Okay. Twenty-seven obligation for fees and expense. Buyer and seller acknowledges that in the event this agreement is canceled or say a transaction is not closed for any reason, fees or costs paid in advance may be non-refundable. So, if your buyer pays for a four hundred dollar inspection and the deal isn't closed, they're out four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. If they pay for five hundred dollars for an appraisal and the deal is not closed, they're out five hundred dollars. They're now out nine hundred dollars, not including if they don't get their earnest money back. It's pretty serious. That's why we want to vet our buyers. We want to make sure that they are approved, that they are serious about buying, uh, and that they're not just leading you on. And I think you need to have that conversation, especially if it's a first time home buyer that's short on cash. You understand you're not ready to pull the trigger on this deal. You're going to spend 400 on the inspection, you're going to spend 500 on the appraisal, and you're earnest money. And it falls through, they're going to be mad at you, bro. And then if, you, if it falls through and then you're ready to go look at another home, Get ready to pay all those fees all over again. Uh, it's a it's a conversation worth having. Worth having. Uh, when you start getting to some of your buyers that are buying, you know, higher end homes, four hundred dollar inspection to them is, you know, not as important as it is for that first time home buyer that's you know doing a FHA three and a half percent down and they don't have as much liquid uh, cash. Uh, electronic signatures or Assemblies for millennials, faxes of uh, signatures on documents shall be deemed valid and shall have the same effect as the original signature. Disclosure, the purchase price in terms of the sale may be disclosed after closing to any applicable MLS system. So after we close on a deal, we can go to MLS and put, uh, if it's a $200,000 home, that it was, that it sold for 200000 and the seller gave $5,000 in concessions. We can put that on there. Because uh, that's important. When I'm running comps for a buyer, I may you may see the purchase price that it sold for two hundred thousand. That it's you know one hundred dollars a square foot. Well, under that term, I also saw that the seller gave the buyer eight thousand dollars in credit. So did it really sell for hundred dollars a square foot? On paper, it did, yeah. but there were some concessions taken back, yeah. and I had to do that with my. I have a listing in Lake Forest that's under contract right now. And my 
had to let Melissa get to know, like, this is a $170,000 home. You're going to get beat up on the inspection, and you're going to get beat up on uh, concessions, seller concessions. We're talking about first-time home buyers, people that don't have a whole lot of cash. They want the house. They just don't have all the cash that they need. Um, so let's work with them. Yeah. Nine out of ten deals that you're going to get, they're going to ask for closing calls. It's going to happen. And let's be prepared for it. And let's have that conversation on the front end. I'm speaking from a listing standpoint. Talk to your uh, talk to your client about that. Um, most of your buyers are going to be asking for it. I ask for it every time I buy a house. I don't want to go to the closing table. Do you usually get it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, because you know, the last house that we bought, they were asking two eighty six, and I knew that with my it was Robert's brother, so I got two point two commission, which is. <laughs> that. Um, I knew I was getting two percent, two point two percent on my commission. I rolled that into my closing costs, so I just told the title company, "Don't issue me a check for my commission. Just apply it toward my closing costs." And I think I asked for six thousand dollars in closing costs. So instead of offering two eighty six and asking for six thousand, it was a house I was in kind of high demand. We went in at two ninety. I knew the house was going to appraise for two ninety. I don't care about the three thousand dollars that I'm going to pay a little bit more each month, but I got $6,000 out of it. My contract got accepted. So $6,000 plus my $8,000 commission or whatever it was, it was like 14 grand. It went to the closing table with like four grand and I bought a $290,000 house. Uh, no, it went way more because I had my down payment. But uh, it wasn't, I mean, as realtors, we can really use that leverage, uh, which is nice. So it, it doesn't, uh, even at that price range I asked for. I'm just trying to keep as much money in my pocket as I can. I had a client that, um, the one that we, my buyer that we offered on, um, the house was like 179 and he wanted closing costs, so he did like 184 with closing costs. And just it's great, it's, a, to, it's a great method because it doesn't affect the seller. The seller exactly. walks away at the same price. You only have to be mindful of the appraisal. Will it appraise at that 184? Right. You right. have to be confident that it will be. Uh, otherwise, you'll run into an issue and it won't phrase and you have to go back to the drawing board. Right. All right, 30 other agreements this time is agreed by the parties that buyer in making this offer and entering into this agreement has not relied upon any statement, representation, promise, understanding, or agreement whatsoever, whether expressed or implied by seller or any agent outside the written parameters of this agreement. No modification of this agreement shall be binding unless attached here to and signed by both. Um, this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, if you're going to talk about something outside of this contract, put it in writing. All right. Um, one thing about that. So that's item number 30. Make a note. Under item number 30, your buyer has to initial underneath this. Um, this is kind of a kind of a hold harmless to our agents on this. I guess that's a good word for number 30. Uh, further, buyer and seller agree to discharge or release any agents for any claims, dam demands, damages, actions, causes uh, arising in this agreement with anything related to the property. And it lists a whole bunch of things. It basically just takes the onus off of us for holding us to anything. So we need to make sure that the buyer's initial that. 31, Fair Home Single Tax Corporation, uh, unless you're writing an offer on a property that is on the Fair Home Single Tax, uh, where you don't, your buyer will not own the land. There must be a map somewhere you can look at. There is, uh, it's on here. Uh, and it should be on the listing that it's a, a Fair Home Single Tax Corp deal. Uh, for the purpose of this one, this is not a FSTC property. Uh, number 32, uh, y'all are all in the Daphne office, right? Mm -hmm. So, y'all may start selling condos later. If y'all are not right now, then uh, number 32, this property is not a condominium. 100% would not write any offers for clients on a condo without partnering up with someone. There's a lot going on in condos. I've sold everything from commercial land, farmland, uh, rental properties, investor properties, residential. And when I see condo stuff, it makes me 
makes my head spin on all this stuff. Laws. A lot of laws, a lot of assessments, uh, things that you need to know about. What is the financial stability of the association? Uh, do they have a lot in reserves? And like that's just stuff that like that's the important stuff because yeah, the kind of picked up. Because I mean, people so, are buying it typically as an investment. Right. They buy it as an investment. If I'm hiring you to buy me an investment, I want you to to yeah, find out nice. that yeah, they just they just fixed all their windows last year. Yeah, that's great. I'll buy that condo. But if they hadn't done anything in ten years. You don't want to buy that. Condo. I have a buyer from Louisiana right now that wanted a specific condominium, and I put them on a search for that condominium. And I'm kidding. You, I'm not kidding you. A week after I set up the perimeter, something popped up, and he's like, "I want to come and look at it." And I'm like, "Well, it's the summer. It's probably full. It's mm -hmm. being used as a rental. Uh, I'll see if we can get in there." Well, I started doing a little bit of due diligence before we even wrote the offer, and I talked to another agent in our office, and they're like, e "Yeah." Maybe stay away from that condominium for right now because they're about to do some like major renovations. The pool hasn't been updated in like twenty something years. They're about to do some major stuff. So the HOA that was like three fifty a month is probably about to go up in the five six hundreds. Yeah. And that's you know if you're looking at it from an investment standpoint, that's that's all your cash flow. Yeah. So uh, just what they pay. Yeah, it's expensive. Every single thing that they do in those things are expensive. It affects. Um, what your buyers gonna have to pay. So find the condo people. You know, Heather Loper super busy, but there's a ton of other agents that do condos. Just to talk about your property management. Yeah, we do. Yeah, uh, and we have agents that like Sam Martin, uh, Holly, and Brian uh, have a property management company. I can't say the last name. I'm not gonna say it. Uh, it's a last name. Um, but talk to those agents, they'll help you out. Um, Cynthia Hughes is an agent that I rely on for a lot of my condos. She's in Florida too. So she'll give me the good, the bad, and the ugly, the condos. So I kind of go, after talking to my buyers, and be like, eh, let's, let's look at these. Yeah. Um, and not steering them, but saying, hey, be aware, there's some major things going on. If you're not on board and ready for this, let's go look at some other stuff. Yeah. Uh, but just, I call the buddy system, find a buddy. Um, 33 authorizations to provide to the rest but integrated disclosures. Buyer and seller hereby authorize lenders, title company, and or their representatives to disclose and provide copies of closing disclosures and or settlement statements to the agents involved. They have the ability to send us the HUD to see all the financials before we close. Uh, we're going to review it, we're going to look at it, we're going to walk, walk our buyers through and make sure that everything looks kosher. Uh, additional provisions. This is where anything that in the purchase agreement that does not specify exactly what you're trying to do, go to the additional provisions. Uh, the main thing that you see here, I immediately scroll down to item 34 every time I get an offer because that's usually where you're going to see seller to contribute X amount toward buyer's closing costs and prepays. Um, and I listed that on the one that I'll give you. Um, and you may see something like, uh, Seller to contribute five thousand toward buyer's closing costs and/or prepaids. Seller to pay for uh, warranty, and it, that's already listed in there. It may be something like seller to uh, leave the lawnmower, which you may have already put that in there. But again, I've mentioned to y'all, even on that system, listing agents will overlook that. They will go. They will run through the purchase agreement. And they're, and they're everybody, the lot more. everybody goes to this, to this one right here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you read it in its entirety, but you may miss that. I always duplicate it. I put it in the additional provisions. If it's something that's not standard, I'll list it. Uh, all right. So listing brokerage, selling brokerage. Y'all know all that. Um, so your buyer is going to sign on page ten, and I forgot to say. I mean, the, uh, obviously, the bottom of every page needs to be initial. Uh, very important here. Page 10 is the original offer. Your buyer is going to sign and initial. And on page 11, even if nothing is filled out on this page because the seller has not had a chance to either accept the offer or counter it, your buyer needs to initial 11 and your buyer needs to initial 12. Uh, they need to know that they've seen every single page of this purchase agreement so that you can't go back later, put something on it, and say, well, um, you know, 
this is where you sign, they need to sign it as a blank copy. That they've seen every that they've seen every part of it. Um, I think for the purpose of this agreement, I countered the offer. So sellers on page 11 with seller's acceptance of offer, I put countered as follows. So purchase price shall be 205,000. So I increased it by 5,000. Seller to pay up to 5,000 buyers closing costs and or prepaids. So the seller has gotten what they want for the property and the buyer has gotten what they want for the property. So I'll do something like this. Yeah, you know, I'll give you a copy of it. Um, you know, it's a win-win. Uh, every buyer they appraise, it's gonna appraise because I've done my research. <laughs> uh, so after that deal was countered, my buyer just went ahead and accepted it. In real life, maybe the buyer goes, nah, I want something else. Well, after you get to that third counter, uh, that is gonna be the last one that's on this page. If the seller gets it and doesn't like it, then you have to start going to uh, do the addendum to the purchase agreement. Uh, whoever accepts it, whoever is the final party that accepts the agreement, whether it's uh, the seller that has accepted your initial offer or your counter offer or you have accepted their counter offer, you will put in the acceptance date. So if that was two days worth of negotiating, you're gonna put that date on there and have your first edition. That's first experience. So basically I know this went long. I'm, uh, this is the first time I've taught a class in like three years. I don't think you can make it shorter. You can. No, I think yeah. it went long with Stacy too. Uh, well, well, basically, the, the main thing I want to do is I want y'all to be prepared before you write the offer. Like, just go to YouTube, go to some of our, uh, I think this one was. Uh, There's one on Killer, like, Alex Rock Nice. Yeah. Go through it and look at it. Uh, look at the template that I wrote. If something doesn't make sense, call me, call the uh, Vet your vet your buyers. You know your time is valuable. So if you're going to run around and um, show them a bunch of properties, and you make sure you write an offer for them. Make sure that they're pre-approved. Um, the first thing that I do is I usually, and this is just me. You can have your own um, practice. I always show a property once to someone before I ask them to sign a buyer agency agreement with me. I want to make sure that they like me and that I like them. If I think they're squirrely and I don't trust them. I may not have them sign anything, and if they call me again to go show a property, if I don't feel comfortable with it, I may work with them, but I'm going to have them sign something, or I may refer them out to another agent if they don't, you know, if they're wanting to look at something that I'm not familiar with. Uh, it's kind of an interview, and uh, but I try to get that buyer agency, you know, and if I start showing them multiple properties, I've got someone coming in town from Louisiana tomorrow, um, and we've already looked at two homes. I had them sign the buyer agency. It was a referral from another market center. Uh, I want to make sure that if I spend my time with them on Friday, that we write an offer that they're good to go. So I've already got them in touch with a loan officer. So they're working on that right now. So when the time comes to write an offer, if they come by tomorrow and they see something that they want to write an offer on, I should be able to call up that lender. I think they're using Camille. Uh, I should be able to call up Camille and say, are they good to go? We're ready to write this offer. Uh, so when I submit the offer, I always want a pre-approval with attached to this and send any disclosures that are in the MLS. So when you go to the MLS, look for the seller disclosures uh, and attach that with this contract, with the pre-approval, send it to, your, to, to the listing agent. If they do not have the disclosures in the MLS, it's a conversation that you have with the listing agent. Do y'all have disclosures? It, there's a chance that they just didn't upload it to the system. Because um, you're going to need to get that signed for compliance. Did y'all get buyer packets when y'all signed on? Like when y'all did onboarding? Like every document that you should have? Hey, are you okay if I, I have this sort of yeah, no, no, we're gonna, career path real estate? It's going to cut your thing off. Okay. There was no one in our speech. Okay. So, um, yeah. Y'all did you get a buyer packet? I believe so, yeah. She said that's right. If not, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
If not, just reach out to Melissa or Jim or someone and say, hey, can you send me all the documents that I need for a biopath? Okay. And that's right.